Welcome to the Startup Grind. I don't know that I have a lot to say other than, other than our story. I'm going to kind of tell you our story and, um, and hopefully there's some lessons, there's some bad lessons and some good lessons, but some lessons anyway that can help any of you out if you're going on an entrepreneurial kind of bent. Um, uh, please stop me in the middle or uh, any questions you ask, I don't need to get to the end of this. I'm much happier with something interactive. But I'll kind of uh, give you a sense of when we started, why we started, and, and our journey. I'm assuming everybody can hear me. I don't need to use the mic. Is that right? Okay. So, okay. So, um, so, um, so, in 1999, I was working for an internet company. The internet company was called NetActive. It was one of the early ISPs in South Africa, companies that give you internet. And... Um, we were a listed company, we were on the JC, and um, part of the company was owned by uh, the Mass Mart Group, Macro Dion's game, those guys. And they bought a whole chunk of the business, and they, they wanted to put Macro online. They wanted Macro to have an e-commerce business. 16 years later, Macro don't have their own e-commerce business. But this is 16 <laughs> years ago. Uh, so, because they were invested in our business and they actually sat on our board, they said to us, look, you guys are an internet company, put Macro online. So we said, fine. They said, but we know that you know squat about that because we sit on your board. You guys give internet connectivity, but you don't know anything about e-commerce. There very few people in South Africa in 1999 knew anything about e-commerce. Amazon started in about 1996. This is three years after Amazon started. South Africa, there was almost no e-commerce. So, we said to them, fine, what we'll do is we'll build an e-commerce site. We don't care what it is. It makes no difference. We'll build it. We'll run it for a few weeks just to understand how this thing works. And then we'll build macro.ca.ca. And they said, fine, so that makes a lot of sense because it'll be kind of experiential then. So we're sitting around and we're thinking, what are we going to sell? We don't know how to sell. We, we don't know anything about anything. We just know about internet pipes. So, um, so we thought, well, let's look overseas to see what we're selling. Books were selling, already Amazon was there. And there was a company overseas called 100 Flowers that was selling flowers on the internet. So we thought, well, we don't know what's involved. We don't really care because we're not going to have an online florist. We're just going to sell a flower, tell Macro that we sold the flower, and then close the thing down and go and run Macro. That's it. That's it. So, um, so we found a florist in Santa. We said to him, look, there's this thing called the internet. He didn't have a computer, never email. So we said, there's this thing, and we want to sell something, and we need to sell flowers, and can we, like, if we set a rose, can you deliver it? Because florists have been delivering for a long time. We said, sure. We said, well, what if the guy delivers to Cape Town? He said, no, no, I'll sort that out. We didn't know how he was doing it, but no idea. He said, fine. He said, you just fax us the order, and then we'll deliver it. He said, great. So, What's that? So, yeah. so this was in 1st of Feb 1999. Now, 1st of Feb was just coincidental, but obviously 13 days later there was a big flower event, 14th of Feb, coming up. So we had, we had a database of internet users because they used us to get their connectivity. So we had about 30,000 clients with email addresses. So we thought, great, we'll build this thing and we'll send them an email. It was like the beginning of spam. I think we may have created <laughs> 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 but, uh, so, so, so we did that. So, so this was our first site. There it is. It's a marvelous e-commerce site. So <laughs> let me tell you the 84,000 things that are wrong with the site. So e-commerce is about selling product. When you've got an e-commerce site these days, there's product all over the site. There's no product on the site. So it's all text. Can you imagine walking to Macro and just seeing text everywhere. And that, this is what we thought e-commerce was, right? So first it was a God horrible site. This is our first site. There were some strange things about the site. So, is anybody technical here? Technically minded? Okay. So, this search functionality to have a search facility on your site means you have to have a database. You type something in, it creates a database, and brings back what you want, right? We didn't have a database. So, that's a problem, but we'd seen that overseas everybody had search. That's <laughs> So we had, we had one page. On that page was 12 products. 
it's like four roses and three this and two that. So we only had one product page. So whatever you put in here, when you click go, that button just linked to that page. So you could have put the word kangaroo in, you would have got that page. We had no database, so there was no search functionality, but our customers thought we had search functionality because there was a little box and then click go. So, so that was the first kind of, I guess, strange thing. Probably the strangest thing about the site was the payment page. So when you got to the payment page, uh, you put in your credit card details and you click pay. Now in 1999, there was one company that had just started, they were called ECNet, they don't exist anymore, but they were then, and they had just started doing real-time credit card transactions on the internet, but they were in beta. They were in test phase, these guys. So we couldn't use them. We could, but it wasn't going to work properly. So, so what we did is, when you click pay, a little egg timer came up and it circulated for eight seconds. And then bing, it said, thank you for your payment, and payment went through. And there was no such thing. What was happening was that page was saved, and then that night or the next morning, uh, we had a speed point machine, and I just put in the credit card details in the speed point machine and clicked pay. <laughs> so, so um, it was quite funny actually because Kalahari started, oddly enough, I think in the same month as us. And the guy that started Kalahari was a guy called Heinz Pasturius, and he phoned me about a month after we launched, and he said, who are you using for your payment gateway? And I said, I can't tell you, it's top secret. <laughs> <laughs> he, he tried it, and it worked, and he thought, geez, these guys know something I don't, because he's seen that doing So I said, no, I can't, it's very really top secret. So didn't tell you. But, um, Oddly enough, actually, we think, we think now we're the oldest e-commerce company in South Africa because I think it was us in Kalahari that started first, and Kalahari have just kind of, in some ways, been acquired by taking what that brand's going to go away. So we think we, we're going to end up being the oldest, which is irrelevant, but it's just a thing, I guess. Okay, so, so we turned the site, so we sent out these emails, and something amazing happened is we got... We got 30,000 Rand worth of business from those emails that we sent out for Valentine's Day. To put that into perspective, 30,000 Rand 15 years ago was more than your average florist did in a month. So, so we suddenly got this kind of big wake up. It was like, wow, we built a site that took us four or five days and it was completely packed together. We had some email addresses, we sent out an email and we are now bigger than a florist which was a very big eye-opening moment for us. Um, and so we told Macro, thanks but no thanks, and we suddenly and we kind of realized we'd stumbled onto something. Um, and so what we then did is we did the typical things that kind of businesses do before they start, but now we'd stumbled into this thing, which is we started to understand the flower market a little bit. We spent about a year doing all of this. Um, and we realized that our florist in Sampton wasn't going to be really the answer for us, I guess. So we got a whole lot of florists around the country. It took us a long time to build a network. And we started dealing directly with florists. So the order would come in. If it was for Cape Town, we'd send it to florists in Cape Town. It was for PE and PE, etc. We stumbled along the way many, many times. But we landed up growing this supply chain, which was basically independent florists around the country that we would outsource and use. Um, and we set up a, a call center. So this was very important. Um, the reason why we set it up was we didn't really want to take orders over the internet, but still today people are nervous of the internet. So most people aren't, but there's still a bundle of people who are nervous about this whole thing. They don't know where the company is, they don't know where the people are. And we get calls today from people and we can pick it up where um, they're calling just to make sure we're there. The questions that they ask are irrelevant. They just want to know. If something goes wrong, they can pick up the phone and phone somebody because they're tired of using an email and getting a reply back in 72 hours. There's nothing working there. So we set up a call center and we, we got our probably fourth or fifth lesson, lesson in business is that it's important to use people who are skilled and trained in what they do. So we were still in this internet company, or I was still in this internet company, and the internet company had a call center. So they had a call center managing people's internet. So I can't get my email, great, I'll help you out. So we thought what we'd do is we'd take, we'd take the net florist and we'd just overflow the calls into that call center. So that's what we did. We just told the agents, look, if somebody calls, 
go onto the website and pretend to be them. Just be them. Now that'll be our call center. Then we're good. We don't have to hire a whole lot of people who know something about flowers. So we said fine. And we ran there for a few months, and we we had some data initially. Our business. We've always been quite a data-rich business, so we had some early on. And we started to notice something very interesting. The orders that were coming from the internet at that stage, we'd grown the site, we'd had the product, was a range of stuff, roses, mixed bouquets, lilies, whatever it is. The orders coming from the call center were almost always red roses. That was a very strange anomaly for us. We didn't understand it. So we started to listen to the calls because we had good call center technology. Now, your average call center agent generally in the internet space is about 21. So that was a big mistake and we hired people specifically for the, the floral call center. So that was one of our early few mistakes. Um, this piece at the bottom here is probably the reason why I, we, we have a business today um, because um, so we set this thing up and I'll explain to you what it is in about 2000, about 2000 now, <coughs> in 2001, 2002, before that if you had a dot com in your name, this was a while ago, you were the biggest thing since sliced bread. Mm. So I was in the press and the news weekly. Because there were only a handful of us, myself, Kalahari, and it was one of the company, or two other companies that had internet businesses early on, but it was a big buzz. Everybody was dot com this, dot com that, dot com that. Mm. In 2001 and 2002, that crashed. That went away. So, so very few companies came through that. Very few. So I'll give you a sense of how few. In the middle of 2001, the dot-com industry had, had started to grow like wildfire and there were a lot of online businesses in South Africa. Most of them nobody here has heard of and you won't remember. But I started a forum in 2001, at the end of 2001, called the South African Forum for Etailers. We called it SAFE. It was an issue with online um, trust, so we called it SAFE. And our first meeting we had, there were 104 e-tailers that showed up. 104 people that either started businesses or were about to start online businesses. At the end of 2002, we had our next meeting, there were 11 people left. So between 2001 and 2002, 100 either online businesses or potential online businesses got away. So the market completely crashed. The whole dot-com thing was seen as this um, smoke and mirrors. So we would have gone the same way if it wasn't for this, and I'll tell you what this is. So it's very commonplace now, but we actually brought this to South Africa. So I went to a conference in 2001. Um, in San Francisco, and they, the, people have started talking about this concept of white labeling. So you may all know this now, um, or affiliate programs, but it's basically, if we've got a floral business and MTN have a brand, then they can sell flowers. We can enable them to sell flowers, they do the marketing, and we do everything else. And there are lots of businesses these days, just like that, tons. Um, there are many businesses that actually, I mean, the insurance companies, there are marketing engines of insurance companies, brands like MyWay, for example, that have nothing to do with the engine that they manage. That is managed by a separate company, and they manage it for them, but they're the marketing arm. So in some ways, that's white labeling. It's a bit more complicated than the financial services industry, but white labeling now is commonplace. But then it wasn't. But we had a big problem because we wanted to grow our business, but we had no marketing funds. This is right at the beginning of the internet era. And at the time, what people were doing is they were going to venture capitalists, and when they say, we've got an internet business, so give us tens of millions of rands. And some people did, but most people squandered that money and their businesses closed. And we didn't want to make that mistake, but we needed customers. And if you want to run a consumer brand, it's very expensive. We spend a lot of money on our brand now. So at that stage, we had no idea. We, we had this engine, this technology, and delivering of flowers. We didn't know how to get customers. So MTN was our first company. We went to them, we said, we've got this thing, the floral thing, you've got a brand, sell flowers. First they said it doesn't make sense and we said look, nobody's really going to think that MTN is florist, but it's just a nice way to add some fluff and fun to your brand. So eventually they said yes and we turned a lot of big companies into florists. So Macro, Woolworths, Dion's, Standard Bank, Ned Bank, Discovery, all had and some still do have flower services. And all we did is we took our site and we just made it look like MTN. <laughs> show you what we did. So there it is. It's pretty much the same site. We even had a number that came through to our call center. And, and it worked very well. I, I, I mean, it, this was the reason why we were able to have a business. Can anybody kind of, there was a big mistake that we made with this. 
huge mistake. Can anybody kind of guess what that would be? Long this was very good for us, but very bad for us. <laughs> what, what? Long stemmed red roses. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, so, what would be the problem with this? Is there a problem? Sorry? There's no net flowers. None of our bread. Right. So, we knew so little about retail. I mean, myself and my two partners, we were internet guys, we knew nothing about retail, nothing about branding. And really, if you're in the consumer retail space, all you have is your brand, but nothing else. And here we, we, we gave the brand over. We were so excited about the opportunity to work for these big businesses that we really didn't think about it. The benefit of this, and it is a massive benefit, and if any of you have businesses and you could do this in some way, the benefit is huge, is um, on an income statement, when you spend money on marketing, leaflets, radio ads, whatever it is, right? It's in your expense column. Beginning of the month, you pay somebody 50 grand and they do some marketing and hopefully it brings business and hopefully it doesn't. With this kind of relationship, which is how most affiliate programs work, you only pay if there's a sale. So MTN was spending money on marketing and if it was a sale, we paid them 10% of whatever it was for the sale. So the huge benefit for us of that is that there was basically no marketing budget. If it didn't work, we didn't pay. If it worked, we paid. But if it worked, we had the money to pay. So whereas the other people who kind of fell away in the dot-com era were just spending money wildly and hoping that customers would come, this model was a lot more efficient because if customers didn't come, we didn't pay. We were very fortunate that customers did come. So MTN, instead of bank and discovery, sent us lots of customers and we were able to go our database. So we had people now with us who were transacting with us, but we didn't pay to acquire them. We paid a cost of sale. We paid when the sale was done, but we could manage that financially. And because of that, we were able to get to 2003 when all the other businesses went away uh, because we hadn't spent a lot of money above the line and we weren't out of pocket. It was a very big thing. But the brand was a bad mistake. So it took us about two or three years and we collapsed these structures. Some of them still exist, a lot of them do now. So Discovery Vitality sells flowers and Ebucks sell flowers and Kalahari sell flowers, but it's our brand. When you go there, it's near florist and it's a partnership, etc. because we won't lose the brand again. But it was a very big mistake. Um, so, so this probably happened, I don't know, probably in about 2005 or 2006. Until then, we really thought of ourselves as internet guys. And that's, we, we, we were profiled a little bit in the media as these internet kind of people, ourselves and Kalahari and those kind of brands. And it took us a long time to understand that actually we're not internet, we are retailers. Internet people are data and internet solutions and Microsoft and who give you that tool. But we're not internet people, we're just retailers. The fact that we use internet is very relevant for our business, but that's just a channel. The reason why it was a big aha moment for us is because all of our skills inside of our business were all focused around retail. We had nobody in our business who properly understood margin. Because internet people don't understand margin. Retailers understand margin. We had nobody in our business who understood merchandise. So we had nobody in our business who could look at our website and say, but the product mix is wrong. You can't put this with that. That doesn't make sense. People who've worked at Edgar's for 50 years would tell you that in a second. But we didn't know that because we were internet people. So this con so the reason why it was a big aha moment is it's quite a thing. I mean, imagine being a doctor and suddenly realizing that, hold on, you're actually in an orphan. And that, that, that's really how stark it was. We, we kind of got this thing of saying, all our training and all our knowledge is technical and internet, and, but we're a retailer. So we spent quite a bit of time then understanding what that meant and beefing up our staff to make sure that we had people in our staff who understood buying, who understood merchandising, who understood cash flow, who understood uh, margin, who understood trends, all those kinds of things that we just knew nothing about. And the amazing thing is that at Flora started in 1999. We had run a business for seven years without any of the skills that really we needed to run a retail business, which is very, very fortuitous because actually we should have, we should never have been able to last that long. And probably the only reason why we could last that long was because nobody was taking us on in the space. It was a vacuum. It was just fortuitous because if anybody had the internet and merchandising knowledge, they would have smashed us. We had such a big glaring hole. Luckily for us, we realized it. Um, 
So this was very relevant for us. So we started to look at the floral market and we started to understand it as a category. And I guess as an entrepreneur, one should know this early on, but that wasn't our journey. We kind of fell into this thing by mistake. But actually, the flower delivery market, which is what we fall into, is quite a small category in South Africa. It's probably worth about 800 million rand, somewhere around there. We, today, we've got, a, um, we've got a, quite a dominant position in that market. We're by some distance the biggest, but, but it's kept. It can't be 2 billion rand. It's not going to be that. The flower delivery market in South Africa is capped at around that amount, growing slowly every year. So what we've done in the past 15 years is, is, is kind of dom is capitalize on that and grown into that space. But if we have aspirations of playing in a bigger category, it's not going to be flowers. The gifting market, however, is much bigger. Everything's a gift. Everything. Food can be a gift. All apparel can be a gift. Furniture can be a gift. Travel, everything could be a gift. So we understood that if we want to get bigger than the flower market, we had to go after other categories, but stay in the gifting space. So today we sell hampers, we sell jewelry, we sell perfume, we just launched a bakery, which I'll speak about just now. But it was kind of understanding, which we should have done in 1999, is how big is the market we want to get into. Maybe in 1999 we would have decided if it was big enough, fine, but at least make a conscious decision. It was eight years until we started, or seven years until we started to understand, but hold on, this market is capped. So if we want to be a bigger business, we're going to have to look elsewhere. So we did that, and we now do a whole lot of other stuff besides flowers. This was, um, this was a very tough decision for us. So in the early days of the internet, so when Amazon started, people were particularly excited about their model because here was the first ever retail model that said you can sell something and you never need to hold the stock. That was the excitement about the dot-com industry in 1999 and 2000 and 2001. Was, wow, no shrinkage, um, no stock holding, no warehousing, none of that stuff that normally, I mean, the macro and mass stores and Woolworths and all these guys, I don't know the percentage, but something like 30%, I think, of their margin is in all the stuff that takes to move the goods around and display them, etc. Uh, warehouse them and cold chain them, etc. It's a massive one. So the internet was exciting initially because there was none of that. Well, the perception was that. We always had this debate internally about do we do it ourselves or do we keep um, using these florists around the country? And actually, the decision was kind of made for us because thankfully our business was growing pretty fast and we were outgrowing these florists. We were completely outgrowing them, so what we had to do was get more florists. So in Joburg, instead of having three florists, we had five, and then six, and then seven. But the problem is, florists are small businesses. Their systems aren't great. They, you know, they, as we as we move to more and more suppliers, so our service levels went worse and worse and worse and worse. And we were never going to fix that. It was only going to get worse because there just aren't great a whole lot of great florists around. So, so it was kind of made for us. We had no no choice. And in 2008, we uh, we moved into our first warehouse in Johannesburg, which was interesting because at that stage we'd been in the business for nine years and we had never seen the product. It's quite a thing, right? We're a retailer. <laughs> at that stage we, we, we had become the biggest florist in the country and I went to work in an office park, no product, zero, zero. So there was a major change. Suddenly we had florists and drivers and packers and all sorts of stuff. Our staff complement overnight grew from 16 to 80, overnight. 16 to 18. So that's what we needed to run a 2,000 square meter wells. But it was the right decision for us. It put quite a lot of um, stress on our, on our income statement uh, to start off with. But in, in six months' time, the extra margin we were getting from taking the florist out of the loop was paying for that. So it was absolutely the right decision. But it was quite a big decision because also in 2008 in South Africa, there wasn't a single e commerce company with wells. Not one. Now, Kelahori have one, take a lot of one, Yappy Chef have one, etc., etc. Then, nobody had, not a single e commerce company. So, we were the first guys to kind of do this clicks and mortar kind of thing. And it was a bit nerve wracking, but it did land up being the right decision. And today, we're having two in Joburg, one in Cape Town, one in Pretoria, one in Durban. And without those, we wouldn't have a business. That manages our business. But at the time, it was, it was very controversial. So, I just want to tell you some things that we do that may or may not be interesting for you guys and in the businesses that you manage. So, so 
retention and loyalty is very important for us. It's important for everybody. If you're here, you know that. It's the old adage, it costs more to acquire a new customer than to retain an existing customer. It's been, that's been banded around for 30 years. So we've got, a, we've got a very interesting nuance in our industry, in a, particularly in our category, is if you go and buy a printer from Macro, and the printer's faulty, you take it back to Macro. And Macro then know that, hold on, that printer's faulty. They get another one that's faulty. They get a third one that's faulty. They go back to HP and they say, there's something wrong with this range of printers. They stop selling them, or HP fix it. And it's a very good, if, if they're companies with good systems and service, which I think there are a lot, the easiest way to fix what you do is to just to listen to your customers. They'll tell you what's wrong and just fix, right? But we've got a particular challenge in that because we're a gifting company, the person who orders from us is never the person who receives it. So there's a possibility that we're delivering a lot of rubbish and nobody knows because most people when they receive a gift don't phone the sender and say what you sent me was crap. South Africans are by and large are quite polite. They phone and they say, thank you very much, it's love, even if it isn't. So that's in some ways good for us because everybody's blind and nobody knows that we're delivering rubbish. But eventually, people don't stay stupid forever. So in the gifting industry, there's this challenge of actually not having that kind of data that anybody who sells for own consumption has. So we're, we're worried about that. We're always worried about that because we, we send out 1,500 deliveries every day. I've got no way to check those individually can't check those. And the best feedback for me is the person who receives it. They'll tell me if it's good enough. So what we do is we have a photo competition. We came up with this, which has been extraordinary for our business. Is when we send you a gift, it has on the inside of the card, I think we do about 50% of the cards, it says, please take a photo and get it sent, uh, win a prize and send it to us. And then we've got a team that looks at those photos and matches it to what they were supposed to get. And that for us is gold, because then we can know, hold on, I uh, have in Cape Town, is sending out lilies that shouldn't be as they are. So that's very important for us. Um, in terms of retention or frequency of customer, so because we're in the gifting service, birthdays and anniversaries are very important for us. So we've got a service that we run for our customers. It's free. I mean, it, it shouldn't cost anything, but it doesn't. Is we ask them to give us important dates of their loved ones, mothers, fathers, wives, whatever it is, and we email them five days before that date. And those emails bring us the biggest conversion rate in our business because people have asked us to send them that information. So the response rate on these, those emails is very high. Is there any way in your business that you can work out how to proactively get your customers to opt in for stuff that they want? The conversion rate, the take up, whatever you're doing is generally very high because your customer has asked for that. Providing you give them then what they want, an email, an SMS, a phone call, the take up will be high. So that, that is very powerful for our business, and we have thousands of these going out every day, these birthday reminders, as we call them. It's so important to us that we actually do something a little bit sneaky that our customers don't mind, is we've got messages on the cards. When you use us, you write a message on the card. So what we do is we scan those messages every year. So on the 5th of February, we look at all the messages that went out on the 10th of February last year, and if we find a message, we scan, obviously the com uh, computers do this, if we find anything that says birthday or anniversary in English or Afrikaans, we send that customer an email five days before that date to say, how can we help you this year again? And the conversion rate on that is high and it brings us a lot of revenue. Customers haven't opted in, but because it's so relevant to what they're doing, um, the response rate is high. We've had two or three times when people have found us angry because the person has died. It's a big challenge for that. They sent somebody something last year, their father, and the father's passed away, and now we're rubbing salt into the wound by sending them an email about that birthday. But we've decided the odd, very few that we have, we manage and we make them happy eventually. But it's so powerful for us as we kind of can't turn it off. So in Joburg, instead of having three florists, we had have five, and then six, and then seven. But the problem is, florists are small businesses. Their systems aren't great. They, you know, they. As we, as we move to more and more suppliers, so our service levels went worse and worse and worse and worse, and we were never going to fix that. It was only going to get worse because there just aren't great, a whole lot of great florists around. So, so it was kind of made for us. We had no, no choice. And in 2008, we, uh, we moved into our first warehouse in Johannesburg. 
which was interesting because at that stage we'd been in the business for nine years and we had never seen the product. It's quite a thing, right? We're a retailer. <laughs> at that stage we, we, we had become the biggest florist in the country and I went to work in an office park, no product, zero. So there was a major change. Suddenly we had florists and drivers and packers and all sorts of stuff. Our staff complement overnight grew from 16 to 80. Overnight, from 16 to 80. So that's what we needed to run a 2,000 square meter well. But it was the right decision for us. It put quite a lot of um, stress on our, on our income statement uh, to start off with. But in, in six months time, the extra margin we were getting from taking the florist out of the loop was paying for that. So it was absolutely the right decision. But it was quite a big decision because also in 2008 in South Africa, there wasn't a single e-commerce company with Wales. Not one. Now, Kelahori have one, take a lot of one, Yapi Chef have one, etc., etc. Then nobody had, not a single e-commerce company. So we were the first guys to kind of do this clicks and mortar kind of thing. And it was a bit nerve-wracking, but it did land up being the right decision. And today we're having two in Joburg, one in Cape Town, one in Pretoria, one in Durban. And without those, we wouldn't have a business. That manages our business. But at the time, it was, it was very controversial. So I sort of tell you some things that we do that may or may not be interesting for you guys and in the businesses you manage. So, so retention and loyalty is very important for us. It's important for everybody. If you're here, you know that. It's the old adage, it costs more to acquire a new customer than to retain an existing customer. It's been, that's been bandied around for 30 years. So we've got, a, we've got a very interesting nuance in our industry, in a, particularly in our category, is if you go and buy a printer from Macro, and the printer's faulty, you take it back to Macro. And Macro then know that, hold on, that printer's faulty. They get another one that's faulty. They get a third one that's faulty. They go back to HP and they say, there's something wrong with this range of printers. They stop selling them or HP fix it. And it's a very good, if, if they are companies with good systems and service, which I think there are a lot, the easiest way to fix what you do is to just to listen to your customers. They'll tell you what's wrong and just fix, right? But we've got a particular challenge in that because we're a gifting company, the person who orders from us is never the person who receives it. So there's a possibility that we're delivering a lot of rubbish and nobody knows because most people when they receive a gift don't phone the sender and say what you sent me was crap. South Africans are by and large are quite polite. They phone and they say thank you very much, it's lovely, even if it isn't. So that's in some ways good for us because everybody's blind and nobody knows that we're delivering rubbish. But eventually people don't stay stupid forever. So in the gifting industry there's this challenge of actually not having that kind of data that anybody who sells for own consumption has. So we're, we're worried about that. We're always worried about that because we, we send out 1,500 deliveries every day. I've got no way to check those individually. Can't check those. And the best feedback for me is the person who receives it. They'll tell me if it's good or not. So what we do is we have a photo competition. We came up with this, which has been extraordinary for our business. Is when we send you a gift, it has on the inside of the card, and we do about 50% of the cards, it says, please take a photo and get it sent, uh, win a prize and send it to us. And then we've got a team that looks at those photos and matches it to what they were supposed to get. And that for us is gold because then we can know, hold on, I uh, have in Cape Town is sending out lilies that shouldn't be as they are. So that's very important for us. Um, in terms of retention or frequency of customer, so because we're in the gifting service, birthdays and anniversaries are very important for us. So we've got a service that we run for our customers. It's free. I mean, it, it shouldn't cost anything, but it doesn't is we ask them to give us important dates of their loved ones, mothers, fathers, wives, whatever it is, and we email them five days before that date. And those emails bring us the biggest conversion rate in our business because people have asked us to send them that information. So the response rate on these, those emails is very high. Is there any way in your business that you can work out how to proactively get your customers to opt in for stuff that they want the conversion rate, the take up, whatever you're doing is generally very high because your customer has asked for that. Providing you give them then what they want, an email, an SMS, a phone call, the take up will be high. So that, that is very powerful for our business and we have thousands of these going out every day, these birthday reminders as we call them. It's so important to us that we actually do something a little bit sneaky that our customers don't mind is we've got messages on the cards. So when you use us, you write a message on the card. So what we do is 
we scan those messages every year. So on the 5th of February, we look at all the messages that went out on the 10th of February last year. And if we find a message, we scan, obviously the comp uh, computers do this. If we find anything that says birthday or anniversary in English or Afrikaans, we send that customer an email five days before that date to say, how can we help you this year again? And the conversion rate on that is high and it brings us a lot of revenue. Customers haven't opted in, but because it's so relevant to what they're doing, um, the response rate is high. We've had two or three times when people have found us angry because the person has died. It's a big challenge with that. They sent somebody something last year, their father, and the father's passed away, and now we're rubbing salt into the wound by sending them an email about that birthday. But we've decided the odd, very few that we have, we manage and we make them happy eventually, but it's so powerful for us as we kind of can't turn it off. And it's, customers don't see it as spam because it's very relevant. That birthday did come up again, and they kind of appreciate it. So because it's targeted, we don't think it's spam. I just want to talk about um, how more and more I'm seeing that, that ideas can be much simpler than when you start out with, with trying to eat an elephant. Often problems are solved by very simple ideas. And what, what we keep doing is thinking to, in a too complicated manner. Thinking, well, we've got to get these and these and that, but the answer can be very, very simple, which it was. Um, just we've got a petals program, which is relevant for retention. So we don't have a loyalty program, too complicated. Nobody wants to buy flowers and exchange them for Voyager or Atios, or too, too complicated. So when you buy 10 times from us, you get a free bouquet, and it's a little, it's like the Starbucks coffee. We built a stamp on our site, and every time you buy it, the petal gets um, cut it in, and it works pretty well. Um, <coughs> this is also a, an interesting idea for us: is when you order from us, we take your order, but we deliver it to a third party. But that third party is not our customer. We don't really, besides knowing their name and surname and address and contact number, we don't really know much about them. But every time we deliver, we touch two people which means that effectively our database is twice as big as it is, but the recipient we have no information for. So what we do is we ask our customers to give us a recipient email address. Now, we tell our customers that this is why we want it, which we do want it, but we want it for another reason. So we send the recipient, for those customers that give us the email address, not everybody does and it's not a compulsory field, we send the recipients an email when they get it and we say, X, Y, Z, how was the delivery? Was it okay? Was it great? Was it, uh, was it lousy? Was it okay? Was it great? <coughs> and we click submit. But this is key. So because the customer gave us a recipient's email address, we now have an opportunity to get that person on our database, and that person won't be a random person because they've just experienced our service. Hopefully it was a good service, and then they get an email from us a week later. They put the two and two together and say, well, actually, I'll use them. And this has... This has grown our database by almost double because obviously we're touching two people every time and it took us a long time to work out that let's use our recipient data because we're getting it but we need their permission so this this helps us with our service and obviously we take it seriously but the main reason for this is to acquire recipients at zero cost in the market if you want to acquire a customer generally an e-commerce company company wants to acquire a customer which means get a customer to buy from you for the first time can cost around 500 rand a customer. If you're looking for 50,000 customers, that's two and a half million rand, 25 million, I think, I think it's 25 million. So this costs money, and it's growing our database very rapidly, which is, which is very beneficial for us. So, um, so just the last two or three slides. So I talk about a site, but a site is just a business. In our business, it's mostly a website, because that's where our business comes from. But I read an article about a year ago, which is such a powerful article for me, which said, if you care, from a consumer-facing point of view, make your business, your website, whatever it is, about one thing. Try and focus on one thing, because there's so many ideas that come into our head every day as entrepreneurs, whatever you're reading, etc., that you can do a lot of things very averagely, but your consumers don't want that, actually. Your consumers mostly want you to do one thing very well. Whatever that is, whatever it is. 
And <clears throat> most companies that I experience don't portray that. So they do a lot of things reasonable, which is, which is okay, but it doesn't really give you a competitive advantage. So we kind of try to think about our business and what is the one thing that we could give our customers. It's a simple thing, you'll see it's not fancy, but it has helped our business quite considerably. So one of the challenges that we had with our customers is when they come to our site, most people buy flowers because there's an occasion. There's a birthday, an anniversary, somebody's in hospital, there's some kind of reason for it. And we were noticing that our customers were battling to find the right product on our site. They'd come to our site and we've got all sorts of fancy ways to navigate. Search by price, search by this, search for him, search by flower type, search by food type, whatever it is. But actually, that's not really what our customers are looking for. What they were looking for was a gift to match the occasion. And we weren't giving them that. So, I mean, it's going to seem so simple, but it's increased our conversion rate by um, 20 something percent, which is very significant in our business. Is when you come to our site, we give you a pop up. Now, pop ups, some people think are annoying, but this has worked very well for us. So, we've got all sorts of navigation, but at the end of the day, that's the one thing that our customers really want is yes, it's a sympathy. I don't have to trawl through your site and find mainly white flowers because that's what most people send for sympathy. Just take me there quickly. You know that I'm looking for an occasion, so serve that. It's, it's a powerful lesson because, I think, because um, I find that in restaurants sometimes, I find when I go to a restaurant and the menu is 48 pages long, I don't think they're doing their customers a service. They think they are. They think they're giving their customers range. But if they surveyed their customers, I think their customers would say, this is, it's like a mountain to climb here. I don't want to work so hard to order a salad. I just don't. So you think you're doing great stuff, but actually you're cocking it up. And if the, I, I think restaurants understood what customers want to do is find that they want pretty quickly. They would change how their menu works. Just do one thing. Do one thing well. I think your customers will respond. So that's the one thing that we've decided to do is try to make our navigation as good as possible. And that feature for now seems to be the best option we have. We may iterate it, but for now, it's what it is. So my second last slide, I think, is just so we've bucked the trend in the internet industry from one point of view. We're not owned by a multinational company, we're a private company. Um, and one of the reasons why we've been able to do that and stay that way is because we've been profitable from an early age. So we've been profitable since, I think, 2002, uh, where very few internet companies today are profitable. So Kalahari, Take A Lot or Not, Yuppie Chef or Not, Superbalist or Not, Xander or Not, Spree or Not, they're all in a growth phase, but that growth phase is a long, Kalahari's growth phase has been 17 years. So, so, so I, th I think the lesson, I don't know that we follow this always, but if I were to go back from the start, I would follow this, is have a clear line to profitability. It doesn't mean it's going to work. It doesn't, you can't say that July 2018 you want to be profitable. If you're not profitable in July 2018, maybe it'll be three months later, maybe you would have had a change. But at least have a clear line to it. Because if you don't have a clear line to it, you, you, will, you, you have no way of knowing how to direct to get to a position where you can start to make these decisions. So I think these are the key decisions that you can make in business. And you can't do this unless you're making money. So if you make money, you can decide to reinvest it in the business. You can bank the money. You can reward employees. You can look for new opportunities. You can take some risks. All these kinds of things are the luxury that you have if you are profitable. Now, most startup businesses are not profitable, and that's understood. But what you don't want to be doing is thinking every night, how on earth am I going to get this business to profitability? You want to have some kind of road, even if you don't get there. But it'll help you do the right things. I think it's so important for entrepreneurs, because I find too many entrepreneurs, and I mean, I think it's one of the reasons why businesses fail, and most do, what they say 9 out of 10 businesses fail, is because I think people write a fancy business plan, but it's not a real business plan. It's nonsense. It's a spreadsheet that has some lines and it says, well, I'll just grow by this much and this. But it, it, there isn't real thought about, hold on, I want to be profitable in 18 months. These are the things I'm going to need to do. And they may change. Six months later, you may realize that thing wasn't a good idea. I'm going to put this thing. But it gives you a road to profitability. And I think it's one of the reasons why 9 out of 10 businesses fail. Is most businesses that I've met and we consult to some, et cetera, et cetera, when you really get down to core, they have no idea how they're ever going to be profitable. It's a hope. And I mean, it's a hundred year old saying hope isn't a strategy. Absolutely not. It never has been, it's never been.